Auschwitz-Birkenau was the largest extermination center created by the Nazis. It has become the symbol of the Holocaust and of willful radical evil in our time. In order to help focus this topic in Holocaust education, we will discuss one of the most important and unique primary sources on the camp, the Auschwitz album. The Auschwitz album is the only surviving visual evidence of the process leading to the mass murder of the Jews at Auschwitz-Birkenau, depicting the arrival and processing of a transport of Hungarian Jews in the spring of 1944. It was discovered after the war by 18-year-old Lily Jacob, who herself had been deported to the camp from Carpathoruthenia in this transport. You can find detailed information on the Auschwitz album in our publications and our website. As educators, we propose to begin teaching this subject by providing historical background material, information on the camp and on the album itself, as we do in this video. In keeping with our educational philosophy, we then recommend following the process the Jews arriving at the camp went through by observing and analyzing photographs from the album alongside testimony from Jewish camp survivors. In teaching this subject, it's important to devote time to the silence and the nullification of those murdered in the Holocaust, recognizing that many of the personal experiences, both on the way to being murdered and in the murder itself, have never been documented and are now lost. Auschwitz-Birkenau was the largest Nazi concentration and extermination camp. Historians estimate that between 1.1 and 1.3 million people perished in Auschwitz-Birkenau during the less than five years of its existence. The majority, from 1.1 to 1.2 million people, were Jews. Other victims who were murdered at Auschwitz were Poles, Soviet POWs, Sinti and Roma, homosexuals, Jehovah Witnesses, Ukrainians, and others. The Soviet army liberated Auschwitz on January 27, 1945. Only some 7,600 prisoners, all in terrible physical condition, remained alive throughout the entire camp complex. The rest of the prisoners, some 58,000, had been evacuated in the last death march, which left the camp on January 18, 1945. Between 1942 and 1944, approximately 1.1 to 1.2 million Jews were deported to Auschwitz from all over Europe. Hungary, Greece, Poland, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, Slovakia, and other countries. The majority were transported by trains in stock cars that were originally intended to transport live cattle. Between 80 to 120 human beings were crammed into each train car. In many cases, those who were physically weak and frail mostly the elderly and babies, did not survive the journey itself. The duration of the transport depended upon geographical point of origin. For example, if we take the Jews from Saloniki, the journey lasted between, I would say, seven to 10 days. If we take the Jews from Poland who were sent to Auschwitz from nearby, it could take few hours up to few days. In addition, we have to take into consideration another difference concerning the evolution of the final solution. If we take, for example, the Hungarian Jews who were sent to Auschwitz between May to July 1944, after a short time of imprisonment in transit camp, which means they arrived to Auschwitz with their full family. If we go back to 1942 or 1943, and we will think about the Jews who were sent to Auschwitz from Poland, they came to Auschwitz without the entire family, because many of the family members have already died or murdered in the ghettos. I don't know how long the ride took, two or three days in sealed cattle cars. I think they put some straw on the ground and there was a bucket for excrements. Most of the survivors are telling about the same experience while arriving to Auschwitz. They are talking in length about the loss of orientation, about the numbness, about the loneliness, about the fear, about the smell, the horrible stench that was coming out of somewhere. When Jews arrived at the platform in Birkenau, they were thrown out of the train cars without their belongings and forced to form two lines men and elderly boys, and women and small children separately. 
SS doctors would conduct selections among these lines, sending most victims to one side, condemning them to death in the gas chambers. As a rule, all children below 16 years of age and the elderly were sent to die. Between 80 and 90 percent of the prisoners in each transport were chosen for death. In observing these pictures, one can ask, do these Jews look like they understand where they are? Do they appear to be aware that they are now in an extermination camp? Everything happened so fast. The soldiers were rushing us so that it never occurred to me to say goodbye to my mother, my sisters, and the rest of my female family members and children. After all, we would all be together again after the selection process. Who could have imagined that I would never see most of them again? In the following pictures, they are watching the Jews who were considered or selected in the German language as unfit for work going to the gas chambers. Sometimes it's very lonely work, especially from the children's perspective. The mothers were sent or considered to be fit for work and were sent to the camp as prisoners while their children, sometimes alone or sometimes with their grandmothers or grandfathers, were sent to the gas chambers. These men, women, and children didn't know what is in store for them. Even when they are entering the gas chamber, they don't know, of course, that this is a gas chamber because they have been told that this is a shower, and the gas chamber is designed as a shower. The Nazis not only ruthlessly exploited the labor of those they did not kill immediately, they also looted the belongings the Jews brought with them. Even gold fillings were extracted from the mouths of the dead by a special detachment of inmates. The personal effects the Jews brought with them were sorted by inmates and stored in an area referred to by the inmates as Canada, the ultimate land of plenty. Besides forcibly sorting the belongings of prisoners and those murdered in the camp, the male inmates in the Canada work unit had another task. Under orders of the Germans, they had to receive new arrivals at the platform and maintain calm. Although revealing the true purpose of the camp was punishable by death, some of them nevertheless attempted to give hints to the arrivals, enabling them to pass the selection process. Members of the unit whispered to young boys and girls that, if asked, they should present themselves as older than they really were. A terrible dilemma arose whenever they whispered to mothers that they should hand over their children to older family members. This advice was given in full awareness of the cruel reality of the camp. Jewish children were sent immediately to the gas chambers, whereas young women had a chance to live in the camp as inmates. Although the mothers did not exactly understand where they were, most of them, if they could, chose not to part with their children. Those who weren't sent immediately to the gas chambers were taken to what the Nazis referred to as the sauna, Going through the sauna was a process described by most prisoners as the dehumanizing transformation. Still in a state of shock upon arrival at Auschwitz and being separated from their family, they underwent a physical transformation that stripped away every external component of their previous human selves. The shower, having all of their hair shaved, the disinfection, the prisoner outfits, the number tattooed on their arm. They quickly led us to this place, to some building called the sauna, the bathhouse. We waited in line for hours. We still had our own clothes and our own long hair. We still had everything. We huddled close to one another. We felt safer as long as we were together. After waiting around for a few hours, we noticed these very strange figures walking around behind the building, behind the wall. And we thought it was some sort of madhouse. We just didn't know who they were. And then it was finally our turn. And we walked into the bathhouse, we got undressed, and there were workers, Polish prisoners, men. We had to undress, and the SS officers were inside, and we were young girls. We were supposed to undress and walk around naked. They shaved us, but everything was happening with awful screams and with shouting, so that we felt that there was nothing we could ask anymore, and nothing to be embarrassed about. We were just in a state of total shock. It happened all at once. There was no more shame or disgrace, just shock. 
Young girls walking around naked. They were shaving their entire bodies everywhere, on top and on bottom. When it was all over and we came out on the other side of the building, we realized those crazy people were now us. And we had suddenly turned into animals in every way because we couldn't even recognize one another. And in that moment, we lost our humanity. We lost all our friends. My best friend was standing right next to me and I couldn't even recognize her. That was it. We couldn't recognize each other. And then the terrible yelling started. Olga, Magda, Helena, Rosinka. We were searching for each other. After that, there were scenes. It was just so horrifying and we were in such despair that all we could do was cry or scream or kill ourselves. So we just started laughing. We were laughing hysterically just to cope with the horror, with the terror that our own minds couldn't comprehend. When teaching this subject, it is important to discuss the fact that major components of the camp are missing from the album. While it presents the arrival at the camp, the selection, the walk to the gas chambers, the processing in the sauna, and the plundering of the arrival's belongings, it does not present the daily life of prisoners within the camp, nor, of course, does it depict the murder itself. You see the smoke and the smell and the man in striped uniform. So there was a little bit of stories coming out, a little bit, not much. What, what were the stories? What were they telling? That or you get shower or you get the gas. And uh, then uh, we were under the shower. We, we were not gassed. So it probably was not true. And we walked night in, in Birkenau, and we felt the smell of hair and bone. We knew it's no good, but we have no idea. We have no idea. Uh, they, didn't, they fooled us, I don't know how. Or we didn't dare to look the truth in the eyes. In the, I don't know, we didn't know. It was one uh, building, and the sh smoke was coming but smell uh, meat. And then we say, what is this? What is this? What they are doing? Well, what they are cooking? And then some of them, they was French too. They said to us, you know what is this? Your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your aunts, all of them, they are there. And we knew they killed them because we see who was alive. This was alive, we was alive, nobody else. For the Jews in the camp, life was inevitably accompanied by terrible hardship. But we also find instances of a tenacious struggle to stay alive, remarkable incidences of friendship and camaraderie, and an intense desire to reach liberation, to return to life, and to document and testify to the deaths of so many and the survival of so few.